Hi, everybody. John Halde here, and I am so excited to have John Davis with us. John is with Line Hall Central, a new firm in the space that's making waves. Um, but John, you've got, what, a 33-year experience in safety here in trucking? Uh, yes, John, and thank you for having me today. Uh, just I've been doing this for, like you said, 33 years and have uh, experience of insurance auditing, risk management for large corporations, and safety in, in the space. I love that you think of safety as risk management, because I think a lot of folks don't think of it that way. And I love that I used to be an option trader, so risk management is kind of part and parcel right. of the DNA. Um, and, and so we're, we're going to come back to that. But in a previous conversation, you told me that as a newcomer to the FedEx space, you had expected sort of a well-oiled machine, military precision, that kind of thing. And you were kind of surprised at the current state of things in the FedEx world from a safety and structure and instruction standpoint. Can you share some of your opinions on some of the common mistakes that you see happening in the contractor world as far as safety goes? Sure. Um the main thing when I came into the space and I've been in the in the FedEx uh line haul space for about a year now. And so I come in and I'm thinking, okay, it's 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 FedEx. It's it's got all these programs and all that. And then I come to the realization that it's run by a contract. And so when I figured that out, then I started thinking about, all right, so what do they have for, you know, training the manager or training the supervisor or training the contractor on setting up a risk management program? And, you know, risk management is very simple. You have to monitor outcomes and then you have to coach drivers. Right. So the current model we have is we have um, a required training program for drivers. It has an orientation training program and it has a monthly safety training. And check, we got that um, key indicator done and we've done our training. Well, it doesn't really solve the problem of the driver not wearing their seatbelt or the driver holding their cell phone or the driver speeding or the driver didn't do their pre-trip inspection. So the magic in all of this is to monitor those situations from a, a various sources and then coach individual drivers on behaviors that are not meeting the KIs and lining up. Now, you said you were looking for, you said it was contract driven. I haven't read the contract as it pertains to safety, but I'm guessing it's not a prescriptive how-to kind of thing. It's not. And so what the my understanding, and I have not read the whole contract either. So I'm I'm basing it on what my contractors are telling me and saying, the contract tells the contractor that they must meet certain key indicators. Okay. That's the end result. So what's missing is how to get to that end result. So how do I monitor the cameras? How do I make sure the drivers do their safety training? How do I make sure that the ELD is being operated properly? How am I um, doing the following the FMCSA regulations and, and doing that kind of stuff? So none of that is spelled out in the contract, not to my knowledge. Okay. I had a conversation recently with Dale Knox, who I think you've met from Vorzik. He's also a longtime safety veteran of the trucking space and all that stuff. What I found fascinating to hear him is how much emphasis has to be placed on getting the driver to want to embrace safety, to want to learn more, to want to be a safer driver. Um, he shared some insights there. What's your experience in that? Because if you, if you put me in front of it, I'm the type of person who's like, oh, God, I got to do that safety crap with John now. Oh, that's that's very normal. That's and, very normal. And I'm watching the safety video that you make me watch and my phone's out and I'm reading my news at the same time. Right. How do you overcome that? So the, the, the best thing to understand is every driver is different. 
And so I'm going to start, I'm going to start high up. You can cause safety fatigue. I'm going to send you a memo. I'm going to make you watch a video every month. I'm going to make you attend a safety meeting every week. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And it just gets to driver, what I call driver safety fatigue. And so it's just too much. And it's, and it's like you said, the, the attitude is, oh, my God, I got to go to another meeting and, and this and that. And then when you back up from everything, out of all of the safety training, I need you to wear your seatbelt. Don't hold a cell phone. Don't speed. Do a pre-trip inspection. Put your trailer numbers and dolly numbers in the ELD and FedEx parcels and the shipments. Understand the hours of service rules. And basically keep an imaginary circle around your truck and trailers that says don't let anything into that imaginary circle. That's, That's it. You can throw all the safety training. You can throw all the memos. You can throw all the meetings. But what I just told you is what we need from the drivers. I said something to Dale. I want to bounce it off you. And I, and I think I believe this is to be true. Because remember, I'm, I, I came from options trading. I understand sure. tail risk and things like that. FedEx contractors are outsourced staffing agencies and fleet managers. Their jobs to keep the body in the seat and the truck rolling, right? Yes. Safely. It's a three-legged stool. Right. That's the core of the business they're in. I believe you can you can half-ass recruiting and still do okay. Mm -hmm. You can half-ass fleet management and still do okay. You half-ass safety and you're like the guy who's jumped off the Empire State Building and around the 40th floor says, right. hey, I'm doing all right. Right. <laughs> right. It, it, it's going to bite you and it's going to bite you huge. It's going to end up with a nuclear verdict or the $75,000 hits because of crap that it was preventable. Um, right. Do you agree or disagree? I agree 100%. Um, this is one of the things that I talk to drivers about is the lawyer on the billboard is hunting you. They're waiting for you to mess up. That is that is the the whole thing in our society right now is they're waiting for you to mess up. So if you are speeding, if you I mean it's every little thing. If you didn't do your ELD right, it doesn't have anything necessarily to do with the accident, but they're going to throw it to the jury as a red herring to go you know, they didn't even put their, you know, their trailer numbers and their ELD, ladies and gentlemen, the jury and, you know, doesn't have anything to do with it. Um, but they, they build, I've been in those cases. I, when I was a risk at risk management and Lowe's home centers, I would go to those trials and I would see what would happen on, they just throw every little thing. And then I think about a, a contractor in this space and they're going, okay, I didn't check my ELDs. Oh, they didn't do their safety training. I mean, there's a, I'm not sure if the contractors understand if you don't have all of your drivers complete the training by the end of the month, then there's a different indemnity. There's just can be a $75,000 charge against you because some driver didn't do a five minute video by the last day of the month. And then they get into an accident. So, I mean, you've got that. Then you've got the lawyer on the billboards goes, well, you were supposed to do that training by the 30th of the month. And then the accident happens on the first of the month. And so you get that strike against you. Then we go into things about um, I watch the and I encourage the people that are watching to look at the FedEx ground um, CSA scores as a whole and see what the, the major problems are like. A driver not having a current medical card or a driver not having their medical card certified to their um, state's MVR. Those are the things that will bite you and will cause those accidents and those um, those situations in a lawsuit to go, well, they don't know what they're doing. They had this problem. They had this problem, even though those things may not have contributed to the accident. I went to a trucking conference recently and I was fascinated to listen to an insurance person 
talking about how seemingly innocuous paperwork issues can turn a nothing $3,000 fender bender into a $400,000 judgment because the jury decides you're half-assing paying attention to compliance. And it puts enough seed of doubt in someone's mind on a jury that, well, okay, you didn't double check. The company wasn't checking this stuff and the driver hadn't done this stuff. Maybe there is some fault here when all along, you know, that this is not your, your, your driver's fault, but that can just completely flip it in a courtroom and you end up with huge verdicts. Absolutely. Because they just, they start building on every little thing. And then in their closing arguments, they'll go, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, they didn't do their ELD right. They were speeding. They didn't have their medical card certified. They just put all these things. And then the jury's sitting there going, well, they're really terrible, you know? And then that's where these nuclear verdicts happen is, you know, and maintenance. Um, I've got, um, accounts that I handle where they'll do a pre-trip inspection and the pre-trip inspection um, is in a software program and that shows that the that it's been done in 42 seconds. So for me to do a proper pre-trip inspection on a tractor, a trailer, a dolly, another trailer is 45 minutes. Now, I want to tell you in this space, we're not going to get a driver to do a 45 minute pre-trip inspection. But when it shows that the driver did an inspection in 42 seconds, that is gold for the lawyer on the billboard. So you're telling me, John, that you were able to inspect the tractor, all the safety equipment, lights, brakes, everything, trailer one, dolly, trailer two, and did all that in 42 seconds. And then they're looking at the jury <laughs> and it's done. That's where the nuclear verdict happens right there. And even the dimmest jury can figure out what that means is you sat in the truck, you pulled open the pre-trip and you went boom, 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 boom. And it took you 42 seconds to hit yes to all the questions and move on. Correct. Right. Correct. Do, do most contractors, and this may be a completely silly idea, but do most contractors pay the drivers for safety training time and for pre-trip time and those kinds of things? Historically, no. No. Is that, a, is that a misaligned incentive? It could. It's it's from the drivers. Absolutely. Because that's part of the issue with the driver is they're going, I don't want to do this. I don't want to get do paid that. for this. Yeah. Now, certain contractors are um, tackling that through safety and bonus incentives. So. Don't have an accident. Don't receive a violation. Do your safety training by the date that you're, you know, supposed to do it, and then you'll get your your bonus. That's that's the how they're doing the payment of that. And so, I think you know one of the things that I'm trying to develop, and it's very, it's great in theory. It's very hard to execute is to come up with a point system. So let's say the safety training is due on the 30th of the month. Well, you can give drivers more points if they do the training by the 15th of the month or the 10th of the month or the 5th of the month. They don't get any um, dings on the trailer. They don't, you know, they show up on time. They keep their truck clean. You know, there's all these points you could add to really get a better idea of what's going on. The problem is, is executing that because you would have to, you know, I don't know what the trucks claim <laughs> with all the contractors I have, but those are the kind of things that I think about that you could really take the, you know, your safety program to the next level. Um, one of the things that I try to do in risk management and safety is get the driver down to a baseball card. What are their stats? You know, do they know how to use their ELD? Do they do their training? Do they, care about safety are they coachable um, that's a big thing for me as with a driver are is the driver coachable are they willing to learn from you know a behavior and improve it's funny i don't think you'd see coachable on a baseball card but i think it belongs on there but yeah usually you're only trading the major leaguers so if they're not coachable they haven't hit there but um 
you talk a lot about risk management. I'm a numbers guy, mm -hmm. right? And I've talked to people and I've said, if not doing the safety stuff means 99% of the time you're going to run A-OK, -okay, but doing the safety stuff means 99.8% of the time you're going to run A-OK. -okay. A lot of people look at me and go, that's a lot of work for 0.8 of a percent. And I, I shake my head because that's not the number. I mean, I'm making up the numbers here, but right. when you get into these tail risks, what you've just gone is from 1% to a 0.2%. That's one-fifth the likelihood. Not doing it means you're five times more likely to have a problem. True. And people don't see that those small numbers actually magnify like that. And the cost, it blows my mind. I mean, that 75 grand may seem like nothing, but put four of those together in a year, that's your entire net margin. There's your free cash flow for the year. The whole Absolutely. stuff you work to put nothing in your pocket. Absolutely, because someone didn't do their training, you know, a seven minute video. Right. And, you know, it's, and I've seen it. I've seen a contractor. Uh, get one of those hits and they had to leave the space because they couldn't they couldn't survive after the seventy five thousand dollars and just so you know your driver doesn't even have to be at fault and be in an accident and still the insurance company will pay a hundred two hundred thousand dollars in a in a settlement to buy a release that happens every single day because they don't want to be in a courtroom with 12 peers going, Oh, that was a big truck. They got a lot of money, you know, blah, 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 blah. And here's this poor guy that can't, you know, walk again, even though that guy is the one that hit our truck. Right. Yeah. I've heard stories that something where you're clearly not at fault. And then the lawyer goes, Oh, you had an it, it was a service violation or, or, Oh, your med card wasn't current. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden they're like, we're going to court on this because they got nothing to lose. And the insurance company considers it a nuisance settlement and nuisance right. settlements can be six figures. No problem. Uh, and that's every, right every day, lo, every day of the week, uh, they'll write a hundred thousand dollar check to buy a release versus a million dollar policy, which is at stake in a courtroom. They'll, they'll do that without even blinking an eye. Mm -hmm. And that back to what the, the lawyer on the billboard is hunting these cases, 33, 40% of that goes to them. So, I mean, it's, you know, a few letters and a little bit of discovery and it's a pretty lucrative thing. So for the contractor, you got to have your T's crossed and your I's dotted. Yeah. And, and it's just, your typical contractor that I talk to, there aren't enough hours in the day. That's the number one problem. There are not enough, enough hours. And I'm going to pause for a minute. I got to say this. Line Hall Central, I think, is a brilliant concept. Outsource services, fractional services, because there's a lot of things that go on in a line hall business where being a specialist and having the experience is really, really valuable, whether that's recruiting or first advantage or safety or other things. Having X number of years of doing it is so much better than I'm a new contractor and I'm figuring this out as I go and I'm trying to squeeze it into my day and I've never really done it before and I don't have time to research it, right? I mean, right. it's just night and day. So I'm so delighted you're doing that. But John's not here to sell Line Hall Central. I'm going to take a moment and sell Line Hall Central. If you are slammed and you don't think you're on top of safety, call John, okay? At least learn from him. He's graciously trying to teach you how to do it here. And he's the type who'll take your call and tell you anything he can share. But consider using him at least until you learn enough to do it yourself. Right. If I know most line hall contractors with five trucks, 10 trucks, 15 trucks, even if you learned how to do it yourself, you haven't got the time to do it right. And be able to get your skills, John, fractionally is huge. And contractors need to know it's not prohibitively expensive. You're not paying a king's ransom to work with you all. I'm not going to ask you to put right, money. Right, right, right. 
Um, so dialing back from that, let's go back to for the contractor who's trying to figure out how to do this well. What are the tools they should be using? What are the things they should be doing regularly? What should let, let you put up the gold standard, what you think they should be doing, and then they can right. individually say, where's my gap? Okay. So understand what the key indicators are first. So you it's in the contract. You have to communicate that with your drivers. If your drivers don't know what they're being graded on, then you're losing right there because they just don't even know the importance of that. So know what the key indicators are. Share it with your, not only your drivers, but who's dispatching, who's everybody on your team. That is your focus and safety. Do that. All right. So once you have that down, then how do you execute it? Go ahead. Just for my own knowledge, the key indicators, they're good indicators, right? They're not stupid things to be tracking. No, no. So they will, you know, did your driver complete their sa- their required safety training? That's a key indicator. Yes. Done. Okay. So then you don't get that indemnity problem there. Um, are you, um, are your cameras communicating with your trucks? Yes. That's a key indicator. Are you assigning your drivers in a timely manner? Yes, that's a key indicator. Are you coaching your drivers in a timely manner? Yes, that's a key indicator. Are you trying to reduce the number of incidents that are on the camera? Yes, that's a key indicator. So there's a whole bunch of of different key indicators in there and the, you know, not having an accident, not having damage to the um, equipment, stuff like that. Okay, but but watching things like is my driver got a habit of breaking hard all of a sudden? Mm-hmm. That's not a key indicator. That's an event, right? That's an event. What are the kinds of events that you think they should be watching for? Or the software does it for you, right? The software does, and there. I'm going to start with that. It's not perfect. There needs to be work on the events. Okay. So. One of the major complaints I get from contractors is the following distance events. There are a lot of them, a lot. And so if you follow the key indicator, John, you have your contract, you need to be lowering the number of events for following distance. And how do you do that? Well, you got to train your drivers. You got to coach your drivers, this and this. Well, the problem with that scenario is I'm on 285 around Atlanta and I back my truck off and put a space in between me and the car in front of me. What happens? The idiot like me slides right in front of you because there's room. Correct. And so therefore I, an event has been triggered for following distance on a tractor that is equipped with an F cam radar collision mitigation device. So that entire scenario needs to be reevaluated because there's even signs in Georgia that you it says okay space. It's a it's sort of a little drawing. You have this and three or four lines, and then a car says this. No one follows that. They see an open space and like 285 or driving around Dallas or driving around Minneapolis or something like that. People are going to fill in the space. Well, we're getting dinged for that. You know, so number one, that needs to be um, revisited. Number two, there needs to be a clearer method of challenging events in the camera system. And I'll give you another example. I have a driver that is leaving a FedEx terminal. They're at the guardhouse. They have to pick up their cell phone. They have to hand the cell phone out the window to the guard. They are looking at whatever the dispatching software is to say, you know, this is correct. An event is triggered because the driver is, the truck is on and the driver is holding his cell phone. So there's all this silliness going on behind the scenes on, and I'm sure there's contractors who are watching this going, yes, (laughs) exactly. Oh, yeah. So that's preventable. (laughs) So so you're dealing with all, all that, and then you have to get into the point the the magic that happens in my world and it's really hard for to execute but this is how we do it is 
I have an event where a driver is not wearing a seatbelt. I use a program called Loom Video, which does basically a screen share and it does a video. I, like I use it. Yeah, it puts a little little circle down in the bottom corner. The driver can see my face. It is important for the driver to see the video that you are talking about. I can't stress that enough. It's the magic on changing the driver's behavior is to show them the video and they go, oh, yeah, I wasn't wearing my seatbelt, uh, you know, and they give you a, I'll, I'm going to give you a story of uh, a driver on the seatbelt issue is I, t- I seen the first video. He calls me up. And he cusses me out. You're not going to tell me how to do this. You know, you, you need me more. To, you need me more than I need you is the sort of the conversation it was. And so, you know, you do get that pushback. But then I had to have longer talks with him about. So what is the issue here? He grew up in Eastern Europe. Never wore a seatbelt. Didn't have seatbelts. Didn't even use a seatbelt. Comes to America gets a job as a, gets a CDL, gets a job as a truck driver. And he became one of my best drivers, just always wearing a seatbelt. He would call me up every now and then and go, I'm wearing my seatbelt. How'd you turn it around? By showing him on the video. And I would, you know, I'd go, Hey, Bill, you know, um, this, but the, the other magic to that is when he did wear a seatbelt, I would do a quick video and send it to him and go, I see you wear. I, I caught you wearing your seatbelt. You did good there. And that was the magic right there is don't always hammer them on. You're messing up. You're messing up. You're messing up. You do have to do some positive reinforcements. And what happened is with that, that using those loom videos and John, these loom videos are 30 seconds long. It's right. not, like, it, it's not like I'm talking three minutes or whatever. I have a Loom account too. And for those paying attention, it costs me 10 bucks a month. Exactly. And I don't have to pay for the people receiving the videos. It's 10 bucks a month for me to record as much damn video as I want. Right. Well, and the other magic to it is, is so what we do is we have a template text message and all I have to do is put the Loom um, URL in the middle of it. And so it basically says, driver, um, please review this um, camera event um, from your um, con- you, you're whoever the contractor is and they'll watch it. And then I immediately get a message back. Someone just watched your video. So I know the drivers watched it. Yes. It, and it's web-based. There's nothing it's, for them to install. Nope. They click the link. It's web-based. And then you have a record that it's been watched. Exactly. And so that is the real magic because if you, you know, what Lytics tells you is you need to just call the driver and have a conversation with them and all that. It's not, it's not the same um, event for them to actually see the screen. And I even have drivers that'll push back where I'll say, I can't, I will start the coaching with Lytics or the camera says you are not wearing your seatbelt, but I can't tell. What do you think? And then the driver will come back and then, you know, I'll have these conversations with them. Yeah, I was just at a rest area. I forgot to put it on, but I put it on a little later. I'm able to go into the video system and go five minutes further than the event and go, oh, he was. And it pisses me off when you see instructions like you need to have a conversation with the driver because most of these guys are working night shifts. Mm -hmm. You're probably working a day shift. Mm -hmm. So if you want to talk during your time, that's when they're normally asleep, right? Yeah. And well, if the timeliness, if it takes a week before, before you finally connect to have a conversation, mm-hmm. I love the idea of losing, using the Loom video because you get your thoughts down, you send the video, and it's fresh. It just happened, right? Exactly. Exactly. And they're able to see it. The other thing that we cannot do in the space, um, because we have contractors that have team drivers, we have, you know, it's overnight. I do not call drivers. Um one-on-one I send a text message first and let them call me you know is uh, you know if it's if it's a serious situation on the camera I'll go uh driver it looks like you hit the trailer on the yellow post as you were leaving the terminal give me a call and I'll show them the video because the other thing I don't want to do is blindside them about 
you know, just, just call safety. You know, I want them to see the video and go, I want to have a conversation about this. And then when they wake up or they're available, they call me and then we'll just have a discussion about it and do that. But I have learned a long time ago, if you call a driver and they're asleep, you are, we are no longer friends. <laughs> right. Right. Um, but the, the loom video thing also helps with the ELD because I can pull up a log and I can go through a log with a loom video in 30 to 45 seconds and go, uh, driver, you didn't put in your um, trailer numbers here. And guess what? what's important? And I'm going to give this as the hot tip of the day. If you don't put those trailer numbers and you're trying to get settlement reimbursements, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> uh, for the record, Mr. Davis speaks truth. Now, it doesn't have to be in the ELD. Okay. Right. There's different ways to do it. Hell, it could be on a piece of paper. Uh, I've also told people who use whip around, make taking a picture of the trailer numbers part of a whip around thing. Do a mini pre-trip. Mm -hmm. If you've already done the pre-trip, but you're at a new terminal, that you have to do this literally 10-second thing of snapping a picture of the trailer numbers. And you never do anything with them till you're missing the payment. Correct. Because Correct. what goes on at FedEx is you go and you say, I went from Birmingham to Atlanta, mm -hmm. right? And they're like, good for you. Nobody says we sent you there. You right. might be repositioning the truck. But right. if you go, and I moved these two trailers, then they go into TMS, they go boom, boom, boom. And they go, oh yeah, those trailers did move from Birmingham to Alabama. Did we pay someone else? We got to fix it. Or did we not pay anyone? Yeah. But, and then I look at from the, the highway patrol officer that pulls up and says, uh, you know, it starts with the ABS light being out. Okay. I got pulled over for that. Now we're going to do a, let's say we're going to do a level two inspection and, you know, they're getting the ELD stuff and go, well, you don't have put, you don't have any trailer numbers in here for the last eight days. Oh, are you required to have it in there for? That's form and manner. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Why didn't you? Yes, yes, sir. So then, then you get into that situation and then, okay, let's go back to the lawyer on the billboard for the case that happens two months from now. Well, I'm going to ask for the logs for the last six months. That's within the regulation. Oh, this driver didn't put the trailer numbers in. This driver doesn't know how to use his, he doesn't know, he doesn't know form and manner. And so all these little things. So I'm think. not only am I thinking about safety, I'm thinking about, you know, settlement reimbursements. I'm talking about this. I'm talking about that, you know, because all of these little pieces go together. And sadly, the there's no feedback loop that exists naturally for these things that would bite you in the ass in a court case. No. And you got you, I guess you got to figure out a way to make it clear or incent them so that the feedback loop gets created that if you're not doing this, I, I wonder, do you want to send drivers as part of safety training to a mock court case and let them feel what it'd be like to be on the stand with a lawyer? say well, i see you haven't done this and i see you haven't done this and well that there's a that's an interesting point there because one of the things that i talk to contractors and to talk to their drivers about this happens a lot driver hits something a deer let's just say it's a deer not a big deal but they don't tell us the deer it is to the deer <laughs> <laughs> for the record, <laughs> for, for, for the record, yes, everything's perspective based. But for, but from from our side, but what happens is they don't tell anybody. They don't tell their supervisor. They don't tell the safety people. They don't tell the owner or only this. Oh, oh, I just hit a deer. Okay, two days later, an event shows up on Lytx. Is this a collision? Yes or no? Okay. Now I gotta now I gotta make a decision. Do I say yes or no? And then some terminals they want to know about deer strikes, even though it only affects the contractor's tractor, it doesn't affect the trailers. So there's interesting things that are going on and trying to get a driver to say, and 
that's what happens with the benefit of these loom videos and developing this rapport with drivers is the one thing I always tell the driver is I am here to work for you and to protect you. And I can't protect you if you don't let me know when things happen. And so I have a lot of trust with the drivers that'll go, Hey, you're going to see a video from last night, the, this, 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 I can get ahead of that. I can get ahead of that and go, okay, is this something we need to be talking to the line hall manager with? Is this something I need to be talking to this driver supervisor with? Is this something that I need to do? So developing that communication with your driving staff and, and telling them that I don't care how bad it is. It's sort of like with your toddler. (laughs) <laughs> tell me you messed up so we can deal with it and and that will help immensely i think part of it too pilots are safety fanatics most of them mm-hmm. because when you have a problem at 20,000 feet it's a very lonely thing mm-hmm. um astronauts safety fanatics right right I wonder too if drivers feel like, yeah, I might hit something, but in here I'm as safe as can be. It's the other car that should worry. Right. Uh, There's some of that, and it's funny you should say that. I actually use that story. I ask, I say, what if you were driving your truck to Bermuda? Okay. And there and there was no safety net. There was no rest area. There was no you know, pilot or travel America or, or stuff like that. I think you would do a little better job of doing a pre-trip inspection, figuring out what's going on um, and, and trying to understand that your equipment is, is there can either make or break you. Um, one of the big problems with the contracting uh, world is roadside um repairs so having a a driver know how to change a fuse is real simple and cost effective versus calling a roadside um person to come over and say four hundred dollars well yes uh for sure um and and At that conference I went to recently, they were talking about doing educational videos to teach drivers how to do these things. And oh, by the way, paying them to do it. That's a perfect sense. Um, But Dale Knox, who I mentioned earlier, he mentioned something that I think was brilliant. When you have a driver who's kind of taking the the road, the mental route of I'm as safe as can be in this huge truck. It's the other folks who got to watch out. He put it back on them and says, what if that's your wife and kids in the car in front of you? How would you feel now that you're tailgating? What if the equipment behind you is not properly secured and it's your mom in the car behind you? Um, and and I, I thought that was like a good two by four to hit him, hit him between the eyes with to bring it home and internalize the issue. Absolutely. So we've been talking for a while and and I'm so grateful that you're sharing this, this knowledge and experience. What are some of the things I haven't asked you that I should have, that you think it's important for viewers to know about safety as they work in the the FedEx line hall space? One of the things that I learned in the first couple of months is train your drivers on how to use the red tags. Okay. Learn how to red tag equipment. A big waste of time is a driver goes and pulls a dolly and the dolly is defective. Driver just goes, screw it. I'll just go grab another dolly. If the driver would just take a moment and red tag that dolly, then for the next driver for that contractor, they know that that dolly has an issue and I don't, they don't spend the time. I mean, it takes 20 minutes to do a set. And so the, if you think about these times and, you know, we're talking about 
the driver being on time. We're talking about the issues of trailers being loaded on time and leaving the terminal on time and returning to the terminal on time. These are the little nuggets that if you'll teach your drivers about how to do red tags, that you can save time, aggravation, and push back to line hall that says that dolly needs to be fixed or that trailer needs to be fixed or, you know, these kind of things. But if you don't use the red tags, it's not going to, it's not going to be good for you. I mean, because you're just wasting time, wasting time. And if you're thinking, why do I want to save the next guy time? Well, that bad dolly you just found, what if the previous guy had red tagged it for you? Correct. Correct. Well, and it comes down to the manager or the contractor is going to receive a phone call from the line hall manager going, what, what the heck happened to this trailer? So if you didn't red tag it and you didn't go through that and you don't ha- train your drivers on this and, and increasing efficiency, um, you know, make sure that they understand the red tag policy. I have some drivers that will keep a stack of those red tags in their truck. You know, and then they just they know and then that way they can, you know, tell the people don't use that one. And I have heard stories, too, about equipment like you take a trailer that's got some damage because you got to go and they filled it up and you don't want to make waves. You get to the next stop, that terminal manager goes, oh, look at the damage on the trailer. Mm -hmm. And then your contractor gets a bill for eighteen thousand dollars for the damage on the trailer. Absolutely. Absolutely. Not to mention you get pulled over and you get a ticket and all this. So you do have to make um, decisions on on that kind of stuff. And you, the best thing you can do is document it. Driver, whip your cell phone out, videotape the damage. It's date and time stamp that this is what we were looking at. And then you'll have line hall manager um on this shift and then you have line hall manager on this shift at least if they don't talk you have evidence to say this is why we are late or this is why this trailer was like this or or that so just teaching your drivers to do that and rest assured the line hall managers have every incentive to say that you damaged it Mm -hmm. because otherwise it's going on their p l if it got damaged on the yard correct correct and So that's a big one. Um, A real big one uh, right now is door pull incidents. I cannot stress enough about get out of your tractor, go to the back of the trailer, absolutely make sure that that door is um, closed and that you have, you know, some contractors are taking pictures, you know, some drivers are taking pictures going this. There is still a problem that there's a procedural problem from this is the risk manager in me is we're relying on the driver. So what happens is the driver can walk back two trailers to get that or one trailer to get that trailer off the door. And then it's closed. It's in loader shift change. The next shift comes on and go, Oh, we forgot to put this package on that trailer. They'll rip the seal off, open the door, throw it on. And some of the incidents are happening that way. So there's a procedural problem from the loader side, and then we get in trouble on our side. I've heard it's worse than that. You know, the light that comes on saying all all good to go. And that's a problem. That they're managed, they're incentivizing the folks in the loading area Mm -hmm. to get that light turned on, good to go, like an on time performance thing. Mm So they're incented to turn it on, even though it's not done. Correct. It's the airlines are the same way. They have the for a while they had this on time performance thing where they were getting dinged by the government and whatnot mm-hmm. that if they didn't leave on time, so they'll shut that door and say we got it out on time, and then make you sit there at the gate for an hour and a half strapped into your seat because it wasn't ready to go. Sure. Um, so. That works against you from a safety standpoint, because if they flip the light on and you're trusting that they're only turning that on Mm -hmm. because it's done and they're still in the back of the truck and you start to pull away. That that's a that's a misaligned incentive there. FedEx needs to fix that. Yeah, it's it's a procedural issue. Uh, To me, the the loader should have the ultimate control of the trailer. 
meaning that that light does not go on until it is absolutely ready to go. Now, when I was a risk, risk manager at Lowe's, drivers had to stay in the cab of the tractor. You couldn't get out. You couldn't even walk back to that because of work comp. You could get injured. Your tractor could hit you. Uh, another, you could slip and fall, whatever. So the procedure was that way was the driver stayed in the tractor. They would look for the light, turn green. They could go. So that's a big procedural issue there. But it is big. I mean, we had to go through this last month with having every driver sign this document that they understood the door pull procedures. and. But I will tell you, I've had two drivers with um, contractors that this has happened, wasn't necessarily their fault. They were terminated that day. No ands, ifs, or buts. They were gone. And the contractor, almost for sure, all of that harm caused to the employee on the loading dock, mm-hmm. all that was put back on the contractor. Absolutely. That's what I'm saying. It's, it was it's done. And it affects your, um, just so we can touch on this for a minute. Each contractor has a safety score, and those are huge hits to your safety score is a door pull incident. Huge hit, and um, they need to be aware of that. I mean, my personal opinion, they should get rid of the lights if they're not using them correctly because it's just giving false positives. It is giving false. The uh, Exactly. Absolutely. And if they won't fix it, I mean, it's almost like the contractors need to pound the table and say, Mm -hmm. all right, well, we're not going to the doors anymore. You you can tow them out to a pickup place when the doors are sealed. Right. You guys have liability. Yeah. Um, Last thing that I went through the CSA scores for the DOT number for FedEx ground. And and I'm just going to go through the big things. the, The most violations are in these categories. Unsafe driving is speeding and not wearing a seatbelt. Okay. So if you can concentrate on getting your drivers to wear your seatbelts and keep the speed down, we can drop those drastically as a line haul group. Hours of service has nothing to do with hours of service. Not having a blank log book in the tractor. And you can get blank log books from the line haul desk. Just go up there, get one. Make sure it's in the truck. It should be part of your pre-trip inspection. Driver, do you have this? ELD user manual. The ELD user manual is in the tablet. Drivers will never, ever, ever find it during a, a, a roadside inspection. Print off a copy of the ELD manual. Have it in your book, your notebook. Put it in there. Tell the driver this is what it looks like. Print it in yellow. I don't care what it is. But when the officer says, I need to see your ELD manual, here it is, sir. That's it. So those are the two biggest hours of service violations right there is paperwork that is not in the truck. Blank logbook in case the ELD is down. Yep. And the manual to use the ELD. Correct. And then the other thing about the blank logbook is you teach your drivers how to fill out a paper log because they'll tell you they don't know how to do it. Make sure that they send it to you by the next morning and make sure you get the mileage put into TruckSpy, what, whatever the system is. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. As a sample? Because they're not doing it on top of having the ELD, are they? Well, if you're missing, so we have drivers that'll go. So the regulation states the driver can go eight days on a paper logbook. So let's say the ELD is down. Oh, oh, if the ELD is down, down. Into you, not that. normally. Exactly. Lost not me. normally. Me. Yeah, not okay. normally. So, but when you have those ELD situations and they are on a paper logbook, you've got to let, you've got to account for that, you know. And again, <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Contractor, you, you don't have time to do all this. But I'm, I'm telling you what I see is is the problem is if you miss that, and especially on a driver that misses it for multiple days then that's a problem. And can they take a picture of the paper and text? That's all, that's all I have them do is take a picture of it and they just text it to me. Yeah. And and then I have it and then I then I know. It also tells me to go, so let's say it's PeopleNet and I go, oh, the driver just sent me a paper log from last night. I need to figure out what's going on. So I need to go to the tablet. I need to deal with that. Again, we don't have time 
to do all that, but, you know, uh, as a contractor, but that's what I have to do is I get this and I go, oh, we have a problem with, with the tablet. We need to figure out what's going on. But also having that communication with the driver to tell me that we have a problem, you know. Uh, another crazy thing when I first came into the space is I had drivers telling me I would, we had, when I go to a contractor, they'll have hundreds, if not thousands of uncertified logs. And I'll have drivers that tell me, go, well, FedEx is exempt from certifying logs. No, it's not. No, it's not. You have to certify the logs. And so if there was a review of a driver that has not certified logs for six months, a lot of violations. So teaching them how to certify their logs, doing all that. Um, vehicle maintenance, lights and tires. Lights and tires. There is a pre-trip button on the dashboard. You just hit it. It turns all the lights on. Walk around the tractor and the trailer and look for lights being out. We can eliminate that. That is not hard to do. Tires, the main thing there is listen for audible leaks. That's the number one thing right there. It's not that the tread's bad. It's not that the depth of the tread is bad or anything like that. It's audible leaks. And it's just, I'm listening. I'm listening and doing that. And then under the driver fitness score, not having a current medical card or not having the medical card certified to their MVR. If we would just do those few things as a group in line hall, we would drastically reduce the CSA score for FedEx ground. Great stuff. John, I'm hoping that you haven't found this too tedious to talk to me. No. People do, including my wife. Um, I would love to continue the conversation moving forward. I'm sure there's a lot more that, that you could share with, with everybody out there. Um, but for today, uh, a million thanks for taking your time to Thank you. hear your wisdom, your experience, your knowledge. Um, and uh, we're going to put all of John's. Is it okay if we put your, your phone and email for folks who want to contact Absolutely. you? Absolutely. About Absolutely. safety and about Line Hall Central? Yeah. And I, I want to, you said it earlier, just call me and have a discussion about what, hey, how do I do this? I'll be happy to share that, you know? Like most people I know in the safety space, you're driven by wanting the roads to be safer. Absolutely. And if that means you're going to teach 100 people how to teach 40 drivers each, that just means we're all in a safer place. I, I know your type and I love it. Love Absolutely. It. Um, so thank you, John. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you very much.